Um, I want to... Uh, I've really had... Yes, I've had some fun this week preparing the message. And uh, it's, I've not prepared, I've not preached a message like this ever before. So hopefully it's good. Uh, you can tell me afterwards. Um, if you don't say anything, then I'll assume that it was bad. If you think it was good, then you can tell me. No, I'm only kidding. Um, today, our countdown to Christmas continues. Just make sure everybody around you is still awake. Just check, everybody, like, no one's passed away, no one's... It's like there's a little spark of life in their eyes. I mean, we want to know. We have procedures for that kind of thing. It's just, is everybody up to speed? Good. Right, switch on. I realize it's a little warm, but it's okay. Beats the last six weeks of rain we've had. Yeah. Anyone else a bit fed up with that? Goodness me. I mean, we have two small dogs. They are seemingly afraid of dissolving in the rain. They only live on the veranda. So they, don't, they haven't even seen the backyard for months. Okay, so today we're going to continue our countdown to Christmas, uh, also known as Advent. Advent, as the screen suggests, is all about a coming or an arrival. It's something that we are expecting to happen. It's an important time of the year for Christians. We remember the arrival of God amongst us. Uh, and there should be a sense of wonder and excitement as we reflect on the idea that Jesus has come to humanity. Uh, there are three Advents in total, and we've covered them over the last three weeks, and today we wrap it up. The first week, Advent 1, we celebrated the wonder, remember this, the wonder of the incarnation. That, of course, is what essentially Christmas is about. God taking on human form, taking on human flesh, coming to live amongst us. The first way that Jesus comes to humanity is to be born, get this, as a baby, born to a virgin in an obscure village. And his first night was indeed spent in a stable. So we covered that in the first week. The second week was the... Wonder of the indwelling, spoke about this last week. This is not Jesus arriving as a baby, but this is Jesus' arrival into the hearts of his people, into the hearts of anybody who would, who would invite him in. It's this, it's the Lord Jesus Christ, the same Lord Jesus who was born as a baby, the same, now comes to live inside the hearts of anyone who will invite him in. He takes up residence in our lives. I don't know about you, but that's quite an amazing thought. It's equally as amazing as Jesus being born to a virgin. How did that happen? Don't worry about that. Just the mechanics of, of that, the biology of it, is enough to freak you out. But then we have this idea of Jesus coming to live in the hearts of people like you and I, imperfect people. Anyone here imperfect? Okay. Just checking. Some people standing up, waving their hands. That's how they... Folks, consider that. The Holy One taking up residence inside the heart of an imperfect one. It's miraculous. It's beautiful. Uh, and so today, and I'll move quite quickly through today's topic, but it's the wonder of the imminent return. Some of you might have seen this coming. It's quite a strange thing so close to Christmas to be preaching about Jesus' return, but I want to do that for you. His arrival... This one is yet to happen, but it's completely certain. Prophesied comprehensively in both the Old and the New Testament is the fact that Jesus Christ will return. We believe at this point that his return sits on the horizon of human history. Um, when he ascended to heaven, here's what the angels said to those who were watching. Men of Galilee, why are you standing here staring at the sky? Jesus has been taken away from you into heaven. And someday, just as you saw him go, those last three words, he will return. I believe with all of my heart that Jesus Christ will return. As of the first two weeks of this series on Advent, this teaching today is completely outrageous. To many people, they will consider it folly. It's unthinkable. But for Christians, we believe that not only is it true, but it's wonderful. It's wonderful that he was incarnated. It's wonderful that he indwells the hearts of believers. And then thirdly, it's wonderful that he will return. Today's topic is meant to be a source of great encouragement for believers. In fact, the Bible calls this our blessed hope. The idea that Jesus is coming back, and we sang it in one of the songs, I forget which one. Um, the hope that never fails. I want to remind you this morning, if you're a Christian here, that the idea and the fact that Jesus is coming back ought to be good news to you. 
It ought to be something that, that makes you smile rather than worry. Remember the bumper sticker, look busy, Jesus is coming. Don't you remember that? I remember that bumper sticker. Mischievous people put it on. But you know what? Their mischief made us think, oh, maybe we should look busy. He is coming. He is coming. Uh, it is our blessed hope. Yet, I, I put it to you that this topic is often neglected by Christians, and it's neglected for various reasons. However, I have found in my interactions with people that most often the reason we don't talk about his return anymore is that we've all got a little bit technical about it. We've all got a little bit um, caught up in the muddiness of religious language. And, and, and in the midst of all of that muddiness, we don't really talk about this idea that Jesus is coming back because uh, we're not sure. For instance, you may not know it sitting here today. You may not know this about you. But eschatologically, you could be a pre-tribulation millennialist. You see, it's exactly that kind of language that has made us lose the wonder of the fact that Jesus is coming back. I think it's a ploy of the enemy. If this thing is our blessed hope, if it's something that has been an inspiration for many and still is in third world countries and in developing countries, they speak about Jesus' return often because they're not so enamored with this life because it's not going so well for them. And so they're looking forward to his return. So they've not got caught up in the technicalities of when, who, how, with what will he arrive. How will... They just believe that he's coming back. And they believe that he's coming back soon. And I think there's something about that that's wonderful and that we shortchange ourselves if we don't believe it too. And we don't talk about it. So. Wherever you are, eschatologically, I need you to know that I personally am a pre-tribulation millennialist, and I'll describe for you in a moment what that means. But that's what I believe, and I want to tell you this morning that that, that is what I currently believe. It's, uh, I didn't read it on a chappie's paper. I've come up with this after thorough study and, uh, and uh, some other research and conversations with people who I trust, and I've arrived at a position I'm not asking you to adopt my position this morning. I just want you to know that I have a position. And because I have a position, I feel like I'm excited about the return of Jesus. Do you want to hear my position? Okay. I'm only going to tell you my position if it will help you to be excited about the return of Jesus. I'm not trying to impress you with my uh, uh, eschatological language. Eschatological, so that you know, means things pertaining to the last days. Eschatology, the, the wrapping up of, of human history as we know it. So in the end times studies, I am a, I'll, I'll give it to you again, I am a pre-tribulation millennialist. I know, it's impressive, eh? It's on my CV even. Um, you, should, you should put it on yours. All right, here's two of what, this, what that means, here's two of the things that it means, and I'll give us to you by way of hopefully eliciting within your heart a real sense of wonder that Jesus Christ is coming back. The first thing is, I believe that his return is imminent. I believe that the Bible teaches that no one, <laughs> no one knows the exact time. And if anyone tells you that they do, you must just look and go, whatever. Okay, just practice that face like, whatever. Because there are people who are going to try. There have been throughout history people who have tried. They have without fail, obviously, because we're still sitting here, they have wound up with egg on their faces. Folks, it's clear from the Bible that God is not going to tell us when. We do not know when he's going to return. However, he does say that he'll give us signs and indicators and things that will, will stimulate our minds to remember. And some of the things are playing out right now. For instance, some of the signs that he said will precede his, his return is there will be a global gospel presence. It says the gospel will be preached to every nation. There will be a global gospel presence. Everybody will have access to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, that certainly is the reality right now, more so than ever before. Yes? Remember when we thought the fax machine was going to be the change? You could send this thing wherever you want. Uh, probably when they first worked out smoke signals, they said the same thing. Well, now we have social media, and truly it is possible that anyone everywhere can know any kind of news. The possibility of a gospel, a global gospel presence has never been more real than it is right now. Some other signs that he speaks about is that there will be wars and rumors of wars. So anybody, yeah, okay. It says that there will be earthquakes and that there will be famines and pestilences, diseases. 
or if you just come through one, affected the entire globe. Uh, there is, without doubt, you can check the stats, there is a upsurge and an abundance of all of these things happening right now. All of the signs that he said would happen are happening. Now, a naysayer would say, wow, I mean, there's always been earthquakes. There's always been pestilence. There's always been famine. No, no. A naysayer will say that. Well, what I would encourage you to say to the naysayer is, yes, there have always been these things, but not at the rate at which they are happening right now. Jesus knew that the naysayers were going to say that, and so here's how he equips us. He says, well, when you see these signs, he says they are like birth pains. Mm. Now, here's the thing with birth pains, not knowing from personal experience, but having, having observed it. They start, and the closer you get to the time, the closer they get together, the frequency increases. Folks, here's the thing. Jesus says, when you start seeing these signs, it doesn't necessarily mean the end is now. But he says, they're like birth pains. The closer they are together, as they increase in frequency, he says it's an indication that the time is coming. And I want to say to you that never before in human history have these things been happening with the frequency at which they're happening right now. It's as though the birth pains are really close together. Yes? Okay. So, I believe, as I stand here right now, I believe that prophetically, there is nothing that is yet to happen before the return of Christ. There is nothing that is yet to happen. Everything that needs to happen has happened. I believe it is possible that Jesus could return before I finish this message. So I better hurry up. I believe that it is possible that Jesus could return this afternoon. I believe he could return on Wednesday. I also believe that he could return halfway through next year. I also believe that he could return in a decade's time or even longer because no one knows the time. But I do know that his return is imminent. No one knows exactly when, but there are signs. The signs are there. And he says it's wise of us to take note of the signs. Everybody with me here? Can you just, just a, a head shake to say, I did not say he's coming on Wednesday. Okay? I, and I, I didn't say any of that stuff because I, I don't know. But I have a sense that it's imminent. For many reasons, his return, I believe, is imminent. Okay, the second point I believe as a pre-tribulation millennialist is the following, that his return has two phases. Ooh, this sounds heretical. I'll break it down for you. I'm sure you will understand in a moment why I say that. His return, his second coming will have two phases. For the, moment, for the purposes of today's message, I'm going to call the first one the rapture and the second one the return. Let me give you a timeline. Here's where it gets funky. Here's where people get a bit bent out of shape and they go, like, I don't really know what I believe. And this person uses lots of big words. They must know what they believe, but I don't know what it means for me if I believe what they believe. And so we cease to become excited about the return of Christ. Here's basic language. This is what I believe. A timeline as I understand it. The next event that I believe that is to happen is the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church is the, the, the taking away of all of the believers. This is when Jesus returns, because when we're talking about his return, his arrival, I believe that his return is imminent. And secondly, I believe that he will return. The first time he'll return is the rapture. Two phases, remember. The first phase is when he returns from the rapture. However, at that point, he doesn't return to earth. His feet don't touch the ground. The Bible says that he will return in the clouds. Angels said, same way you saw him go, you'll see him come again. So on his return for the rapture, he will emerge only in the clouds. He will arrive visibly. And the rapture means that he will take away his people. Here's the verse of scripture. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout and the call of the archangel and the trumpet call of God. First, all the Christians who have died will rise from their graves. Hmm. And then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And we will remain with him forever. Probably the most important part of that whole passage. We were caught up to meet him in there and remain with him forever. So comfort each other with these words. So Paul thought it was good for us to comfort each other, talk about the fact that Jesus is coming back, to talk about the fact that one day we will be caught up. One day I will be here and then I will not be here anymore. Anyone else? Either naive or basic enough or faithful enough to believe that one day, the Bible says two will be sleeping in a bed, one will go and one will stay. Hmm. Hectic, eh? One, one uh, it's not in my notes, I'll just give it to you for a, a laugh. 
uh, there was a group, I'm not going to tell you who they are, maybe a family who joined them. Um, it's a group of people who had a leader who became very emphatic about when Jesus was going to return. He gave them three dates. <laughs> not so emphatic after all. He gave them three dates that it was going to be. And on the first day, he, of course, Jesus didn't come back. And he said, well, I thought the second day was what I thought. Second day also was not, they were about two weeks apart. And then of course he had the kicker the third day. Like, but obviously we're all sitting here, so he didn't come back then either. But here's what I like about when I read this story. People base their, their understanding and some really good people were misled by this leader, but they understood this verse of scripture. So what they did, some people climbed mountains on that day. They're like, if he's coming to fetch us, I'm going to be at the top of a mountain. I'm, not, I'm going to be the... I'm going, to, I'm going to be at the highest point I can so that when I go, I'm there first. There's something pure and beautiful about that, don't you think? Other people went to the graves of their departed family members, which oh, this is hard, and sat there. Because the Bible says the graves will give up their dead first. And they're like, if this is true, and I believe that it is, I'm going to be there so when they come out, I'll see them. How about that for faith? Look, they were, but we, we realized, I mean, they, they were shattered by poor leadership. But the purity of that I found quite moving when I read it. Yes, I like it. I wonder what I would do if I knew Jesus was coming back tomorrow. I wonder what you would do. So we will be caught up to meet the Lord in there. Can I just give you what's going to happen while we're there? Just very one paragraph. Whilst we are there in heaven with him, we will undergo what the Bible says, a believer's judgment. Not judgment for where we will spend eternity. That's been settled by the sacrifice of Jesus. Uh, it's, a, it's a judgment of our deeds and our attitudes and our behavior as people of God. For rewards, not for eternal destination, for rewards. Okay, it's like a prize giving. Guess who's had to sit through prize givings? We met a headmaster in the week who sat through five, no, eight prize givings this year because he goes to other schools. Like, he doesn't have, you go there because you have one kid. He goes, he doesn't even have a kid in the school. I thought this guy's a trooper. Um, but anyway, ours will be a holy prize giving. And we'll all, uh, uh, we will be judged and we will be rewarded. That's nice. Eh? That's what's going to be happening for us in heaven. After that, the Bible says straight after the reward ceremony, we will have our uh, marriage feast of the Lamb, the biggest, most, incredible culmination and celebration of our our union with jesus don't want to go into it too much but i just want you to know that while we're up there some really cool stuff's going to be happening we're going to be given rewards for the way we've done things and we'll be taking part in quite a festive feast yes all right not such great news for the folks who are left behind because while that is happening up in heaven the bible teaches that life on earth will be pretty hectic for those who are left behind with the removal of the church and with that the presence of the Holy Spirit, an evil character called the Antichrist will emerge onto the scene and a time called in the Bible the Tribulation will commence. The Tribulation will be every bit as bad as it sounds. The Bible does say it will only last for seven years, but seven years will have been enough. So, while we're, this is seven years apart, the two phases of Jesus' return. The first one, he comes rapture, it doesn't touch the ground. Comes, the Bible says, in the twinkling of an eye, no one knows what's happening, and suddenly it's happened. The believers are all gone, and we're with him, and we go off to heaven. We're with him forever, the Bible says. The second phase of his return is the one that probably is in your mind most often when you think of his return, um, and it's this. Then I saw heaven opened, and a white horse was standing there. And the one sitting on the horse was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and then goes to war. His eyes were bright like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him, and only he knew what it meant. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven, dressed in pure white linen, followed him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword, and with it he struck down the nations. Hello. He ruled them with an iron rod, and he trod the winepress of the fierce wrath of Almighty God. On his robe and thigh was written this title, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is the second phase of the return of Jesus. When he comes after the seven years of tribulation, he returns, and he comes like this. 
that is quite a picture, hey? No, you, you, no one else. Folks, that is that's both terrifying and, for me, wonderful. Because we've seen how ravaged the world is when evil gets hold of it. So we need a strong deliverer. Go and send a muhu. You need... Have you, have, have you seen the ravages of evil? Have you seen it destroy people's lives? Have you seen it destroy societies? Have you, have you witnessed how evil the world can be? It needs this kind of deliverer. And so Jesus will come the first time on the clouds, but don't think that's who he is. Don't think he's, oh, but scared of what's going on. No, no. The first time he comes in the rapture, he comes for his people. The second time he comes is this. He comes, the Bible says, with his people, with an angelic host, and indeed us, the church, the true believers, will be with him. And the reason he comes down like that is to emphatically deal with the Antichrist who's been causing chaos, and he casts him into the lake of fire. A fitting end. A fitting end. He doesn't yet cast Satan into the uh, lake of fire. And here the Bible is a bit hard to understand at times. It says that the devil or Satan himself is bound up helplessly, and he's, he's kept bound for a thousand years. That's what we call the millennium. I, I really don't want to confuse you with any of this. If any of this is going a bit like, oh, I thought I knew what I believed. No, I don't. I, that's not my whole game this morning. My idea is to give you some context. So he will be bound up for a thousand years, and Jesus will rule and reign over the earth, this earth, and the people in it for a thousand years, and we will help him, and the angels will help, and it will be a reign of perfect rule. I know. Like we're thinking maybe next year with the elections. You know, maybe things are going to turn around. Folks, things are never going to turn around the way we want them to turn around. The, we will not have heaven on earth. All leaders are fallen. It is only when he comes to set up the rule and reign when he is over us with no selfishness, no agenda, no darkness in him whatsoever, no fear of evil, he will emphatically rule and that will be heaven on earth. That's what we're looking for. Not the white picket fence and the American dream and life in Canada and all over the globe, whatever it is. Folks, I need you to know there's trouble all over the world. Is it the millennium, that rule, that heavenly home that we're waiting for, it's not going to happen here. We live here not to try and make that happen. We live here for God and his purposes. And we seek to have him mold our lives and shape us to be fit for heaven. Yes. Good. A uh, weird thing happens after that. A thousand year of heavenly rule on earth. Then Satan is loosed again. I don't know why. Okay. I just don't. Only for a short time, and then he too is cast into the lake of fire, which is eternal, gone, never to be remembered again. After that, the great white throne judgment will happen, which is what essentially the Bible says will happen for everyone who has rejected Christ. And they will receive their eternal judgment from God that we will leave to him. After that, the new heaven and the new earth, which I preached about last year. Or no, earlier in this year. You can catch that series on YouTube. But the new heaven and the new earth. And we will live forever with God in the company of the redeemed. Okay, hectic. I said I would make it simple for you. Maybe I've made it very complicated. I don't know. In my mind, it's pretty clear. Jesus is coming back. I believe that he's coming back before the time of tribulation. He will rapture his people away. We will go to heaven. We will have our reward ceremony and this massive banquet. Quite something lost for seven years. No, no Hanon's braai. That is, gonna, that is something big is going to happen up there. Okay. However, down here on earth, and this should move our hearts, because down here on earth, some, some pretty heavy stuff is going to be going down. This character called the Antichrist is anti-everything about Christ. Christ comes for peace. He comes for turmoil. Christ, Christ comes to bring healing. He comes to destroy. It's going to be rough. If you have friends and family who you're not sure where they're going to be, this should cause you to pray. Because the, the stakes are eternal. That's a succinct overview. I hopefully it will alleviate some confusion. For me, what it does when I get clear in my mind about this, I genuinely become excited about the return of Jesus. 
And it's a wonderful thing. And I want you to be too. So I close with this. Get ready. Ish. Get ready. What I've noticed is you can know all of this, but not yet get ready. Let me read a quick passage and then we'll close. Um, oh, I didn't bring my glasses. That's not going to help. Luke 12. Ah, be dressed for service and well prepared, as though you are waiting for your master to return from the wedding feast. Then you'll be ready to open the door and let him in the moment he arrives and knocks. There will be special favor for those who are ready and waiting for his return. I tell you, he himself will seat them and he'll put on an apron and he will serve them as they sit and eat. He may come in the middle of the night or just before dawn, but whenever he comes, there will be special favor for his servants who are waiting. Uh, I want us to be the kinds of people who are waiting. A story. Uh, author Ken Costa uh, he's the chairman of Alpha International. He shared the following story, and I read it to you. He was holidaying in the south of France, and he saw a magnificent yacht moored in the harbor. Uh, this incredible yacht had a crew of 24 people. Strangely, later that day, he met the captain of that yacht, who happened to be having coffee in the marina, and he asked him about the yacht. The captain told him that every day, the crew takes that yacht out to sea to check all the safety procedures. Every day, the yacht was cleaned to perfection. Every day, she was reprovisioned, and every day, they were ready to set sail. He then added wistfully, we have not seen or heard from the owner for three years but we are ready to set sail the moment he arrives. And I know that one day he will, and we all hope that it is soon. He says, this is how we should live our lives, getting on with the job at hand as well as we can, all the while anticipating the return of Jesus. How do you get ready? You get ready by expectantly waiting. You get ready by joyfully working, by faithfully witnessing, and by fervently worshiping. Okay. You with me? I hope that this morning I've not um, dragged this thing into further technicality for you. Just know that in as much as it's marvelous and wonderful that Jesus came as a baby, so it is equally marvelous and true that he lives in our hearts and has arrived in our hearts. And so it is equally marvelous and true and wonderful that one day he will return and perhaps not many days from now. As we embrace the reality of Jesus' imminent return, here's what happens. Our lives get recentered. I believe this. If you will this morning really think about what I'm saying, your life gets recentered. My life has been recentered this week in my preparation. Things that I thought were really important, you go, yeah, maybe not so important. And I think it's, it's good for us. Things that we thought were unimportant suddenly become important again. But mostly what happens when we live with the idea of the imminent return of Jesus, uh, and I've coined this phrase, a holy urgency enters our being. I want that. I think it's part of the blessing that he says Jesus will put upon people who wait for him, is a holy urgency will settle upon our beings. If you don't have a holy urgency, you know what you'll have? An unholy urgency, which is an urgency about things that really are trivial and don't matter a great deal. It's better to have a holy urgency. It's better to be urgent about the things that really do matter. Yes? If you're on a sinking ship, you would want the captain to be urgent about the things that matter. You would think the captain, a fool, who as the ship is sinking, is um, tuning the piano. Ding. Ding. You'd think, what an idiot. How can, I can't entrust my my well-being and maybe the well-being of my family to a clown like this who while the ship is sinking is tuning the piano. You'd want him to be urgent about releasing the safety boats, about finding a way to prolong the process so that as many lives can be saved as possible. Yes, that's a holy urgency, urgent about the right things. I want you to be like that. I want you to be like that for yourself. I want you to be like that for your family. I want you to be like that for society. We have people, a lost and dying world, all around us, who work with us, who go to school with us, who go to university with us. And we can be tuning the piano while their souls are sinking into eternal damnation. But we're tuning the piano. Are you with me? Let's have a holy urgency settle upon us in light of this, the wonder that Jesus is coming back.
All right. Good. I hope this has been helpful. Uh, it is a it is quite a teach, quite a teaching session. So we won't sing a, a closing song, but there you have it. A premillennial, a pre-tribulation millennialist has spoken. If there are others here who have different views, I respect that. There are people far more brilliant than me who hold different views to me. I'm I'm quite willing to concede that. I don't want to enter into debate with them because I'll get caught up in the technicalities and lose some of the wonder. But today, all we want to know is Jesus is coming back. And the first time he comes back, he's not going to set foot on earth, but he's coming back to fetch us. He's coming back for his people. Then a second time, the second phase of him coming back is he comes back in glory. And, uh, and all that matters to me by all of that token is, it says that verse, we will be with him forever. I don't know about you, that's enough for me. Okay. I was going to keep going until you clapped. So. A timely intervention. Folks, why don't you stand with me? I want to commit us all to the Lord, and then we'll, we'll be done. Incidentally, the last two verses of the Bible are this. He's coming back. And the people cry out, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, we're ready. Come for us. Let's pray. This morning, I'm going to ask you not to put your hand on someone else's shoulder. Uh, just, just commit us all individually to the Lord. Lord, you have made it clear in the scriptures that you want us to be expecting you. All the theologians agree, Lord, that it is helpful for us to believe in the biblical concept of an imminent return of Jesus. It's good for us, God. It's good for our souls. It's good because it, it elicits hope within us. It, it reminds us, God, that you have not forsaken us, that you are coming back. Um, and so, Lord, I pray that we this morning here who've heard this message and anyone who listens to it online, my, my sincere prayer, Lord, is that we would not get caught up in the technicalities. We wouldn't allow anything to rob us of the wonder of a returning Savior. We wouldn't allow anything, God, to get in the way of us just having that sense that it's going to be okay. Ultimately, ultimately, it's going to be okay. Because Jesus never forsakes his people. And so, Lord, we, we do pray that you would create within us a holy urgency. Um, whether that is to sort our own lives out, if there's things within us that, that we've been putting off, procrastinating about, that we know you're displeased with. Help us, God, give us grace, give us a holy urgency to get very real about that. Also pray, Lord, that you would create within us a holy urgency around spreading the gospel, about telling people the good news, about in our lives really believing that, that everyone's life is better with God in it, and that we have the responsibility and indeed the privilege to live lives that cause people to ask, and then you've given us some answers to give. So help us, Lord, we want to have that holy urgency upon us. But mostly, Lord, I pray that this morning this congregation of people would leave here having been uplifted by a sense of wonder that Jesus is returning, that the hope that we yearn for is not going to be a political deliverance. The, the future that we dream of, the, the place our hearts have been designed for, the, God, it, it's, it's not going to ever arrive satisfactorily in this life. But we yearn, God, for your return. We say, Lord Jesus, today we pray here now. We say, Lord, come and fetch us. Lord, many are tired. People are fatigued. If, if you tarry, God, give us grace to survive. But you do say we can ask, Lord, come and fetch us. Give us work to do until that time and help us to do that work well. All these things, Father, we ask in the precious and majestic name of our returning Savior, the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen, folks. Have a lack of Sunday. We'll see you on Sunday evening, 5 o'clock.